<clears throat> well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, for the two kind introductions. And uh, um, I really have trouble sometimes seeing myself in my own introduction. In any case, I do wish to thank uh, Helena Mitchie, uh, Brian Rydell, Victoria Massey, and Julia Saltz, and members of the Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Rice University for the opportunity to speak with you. I'm honored and overjoyed to be here. In this talk, I wish to show by direct inspection that belief in the male-female gender binary we have grown up with is no more than a quaint myth of historical interest. The first part of the talk is about animals, the second part about people. This slide shows geckos from the South Pacific Islands who reproduce asexually. Many other species do too, including whiptail lizards from the American Southwest. Because their eggs do not need fertilization, these species consist solely of females. Thus, reproduction is perfectly possible without sex. And the purpose of sex is to, pro to provide the offspring with a mixture of genes from two parents. To define male and female in a way that applies to all living things, from seaweeds to sea lions, biologists define a male as an individual who, re who produces solely sperm throughout his life, and a female as an individual who produces solely eggs throughout her life, and a hermaphrodite is an individual who produces both sperm and eggs at some point during their life. By definition, a sperm is the smaller gamete and the egg is the larger gamete. The individuals in almost all sexually reproducing species produce only two sizes of gametes, one big and one small. The sole universal sex binary in biology is the dichotomy between egg and sperm. There is no universal sex binary among the whole organisms themselves, only among their gametes. This slide illustrates the size difference between a human egg and sperm. Now a simultaneous hermaphrodite is an individual who produces both sperm and eggs at the same time. A sequential hermaphrodite produces eggs and sperm at different times. Sequential hermaphrodites come in two varieties, male first, then female, and female first, then male. Sequential hermaphrodites change sex during life. That means, by definition, they transition from making sperm to making eggs, or vice versa. Most plants are hermaphrodites. Only about 6% of plant species have separate sexes. Many marine invertebrate and vertebrate groups are hermaphroditic. This slide illustrates three hermaphroditic coral reef species. On the left are blue-headed wrasses, a species with some individuals who change from female to male. In the middle are clownfish, a species with some individuals who change from male to female. And on the right are hamlets, a species with individuals who are simultaneously male and female. Now hamlets do not self-fertilize. The figure depicts the mating dance, wherein one fish releases eggs and the other releases, releases sperm. They then turn over and reverse roles across both marine and terrestrial environments, about 6% of all animal species are hermaphroditic. However, if the insects are not counted, the percentage rises to about 33% of animal species that are hermaphroditic. Now in fish, parental care of eggs is usually provided by males. On the bottom is a pipefish from a group of fish whose long tubular bodies resemble a flute. In pipefish, the males glue the fertilized eggs to their bellies while they swim around. Seahorses are derived from pipefish. In seahorses, 
The males have a skin flap on their bellies into which females deposit their eggs, causing the male to become, so to speak, pregnant. As a result, females in some seahorse species can produce eggs faster than the males can give birth to the eggs that they are incubating. Hence, the females can mate with more males than males can mate with females, so that the males become choosy and the females promiscuous. This is called sex role reversal. Now, the existence, the mere existence of sex role reverse species such as the seahorse demonstrates that no connection necessarily exists between gamete size and sex role. The promiscuous versus choosy dichotomy can apply to either sex, regardless of the fact that males always make the smaller gamete and females the larger gamete. An anglerfish is about the size of a golf ball and named because of the bait-like tassel at the end of a front-facing dorsal spine. The fish de depicted is a female. The bumps on its bottom so are males, sometimes called dwarf males or parasitic males. They are physically attached to the female and in some species are connected with the female's blood circulatory system. One female mated with multiple males is polyandry, as in this case. Dwarf males illustrate the ultimate in a male who brings only his sperm to the mating. If all males, like anglerfish males, were no more than heat sinking ballistic testes, then they too would be dwarf males. The fact that males are generally whole organisms themselves, rather than accessories carried by the females, implies that males do bring more than their genes. The top photo, or the top, shows photos I took at a zoo in Holland of females from a species of South American spider monkey. Notice the structure resembling a penis. This is called a pendulous clitoris. It is used to signal reproductive condition by delivering urinary and or vaginal secretions. The bottom panel shows the tip of a penis located in the genital canal of a male whale. Male whales and porpoises do not possess a penis and scrotum dangling outside the body. The testes remain within the body. I take gender to mean the morphology, behavior, and life history of a sexed body. A sexed body is a body classified with respect to the size of the gametes produced. For species in which most males have certain traits and most females have other traits, a significant percentage of males can also be found to have female traits and the females to have male traits. This situation allows for what has been termed transgender animals. The best studied example occurs in sun angel hummingbird species from the Andes. Male sun, sun angel hummingbirds have colorful feathers on their throats called a gorget as illustrated in the slide. A female with a gorget is referred to here as a masculine female. She also has a comparatively shorter bill. Conversely, feminine males also exist with special female traits such as a longer bill. Now males use their gorgets in territorial defense of the common short flowers that fit their shorter bills. Masculine females can, like the males, also defend territories of short flowers. Conversely, the feminine males have longer bills than masculine males, and feminine males use different flowers from the masculine males, namely relatively long, rare, long tubular flowers that do not need to be defended in a territory. Thus, gender expression in birds reflects a gendered difference in occupation, and transgender birds are those whose occupation crosses into the occupation typical of the other gender. Now, this slide shows ruffs 
a European shorebird species with three male genders and one female gender. The left panel shows the male gender with a dark ruff. The top middle panel shows a male gender with a white ruff. The top right panel shows the male gender with no ruff. The bottom panel shows the bottom center bottom middle panel shows the female also with no ruff. Now ruffs mate in leks, which is spelled L-E-K-S, a lek. These are places where males congregate to attract females. The black ruff males defend small courts within the lek, within which each displays to visiting females. The white ruffed males do not defend courts, and instead keep company with the females as they feed away from the lek. When a white ruffed male is nearby, and a black ruffed male is alone on a court, the black ruffed male dances to invite the white ruffed male to join him on his court. Females who later arrive at the lek prefer to mate with a black and white team of males rather than with an rather than with only a black ruffed male. Ruffs illustrate gender multiplicity in animals. Two sexes does not imply only two genders. Now the lower right illustrates a black ruffed male mating with a ruffless male, a mating that is homosexual yet heterogenderal. This slide, which I took in 2018 during a safari to South Africa, illustrates two male elephants mating. This mating is both homosexual and homogenderal. And you can see the penis here, which is erect, and here's another penis, indicating that they're both males. Homosexuality is widely distrib distributed across many higher animal taxa implying that homosexuality has originated multiple times. People wonder why the male elephants in the slide are wasting time mating with one another rather than courting females instead. Rather than wonder why an animal is homosexual, the converse may be more interesting. Why isn't every animal homosexual, perhaps mixed in with some minimal amount of heterosexuality to ensure reproduction? Now this slide shows male-male mating in rams and lions. And incidentally, the Los Angeles Rams won the 2022 Super Bowl. The behavior of charismatic megavertebrates often features same-sex mating. The sequence of lion photos at the top right was given to me by a Brazilian photojournalist who took the photos while on vacation in Africa. They show one male lion soliciting a mating from another male, proceeding to a male-male mating. And you can see here that this lion so approaches the one that's lying down here and displays to it, to solicit it. Comes over, nuzzles it, then steps away, lies down, and then this one who would, lion who was solicited comes and mates with it. And after the mating, uh, the, uh, this line just gets up. Now the bottom two photos show that same-sex uh, mating in lions occurs even in the presence of a female. See, this is a female here with no mane. And he, these lions, these are obviously males who have the lion's mane. Now, the same-sex mating that goes on is uh, a special case of physically intimate behaviors of many types, all of which serve to exchange um, physical pleasure with one another. So here are two parrots preening each other. Uh, here are two horses nuzzling, two cats, more parrots, and um, elephants, as we've just seen. Here's some primates. 
Here's a bonobo, which I'll go into in more in a second. Here's a baboon and more bonobos. And, and so these, this physical contact, which involves an exchange of pleasure, um, I hypothesized is used for coordination, the coordination that underlies uh, cooperation between animals. And bonobos, in particular, are our closest living relatives, as shown in the family tree of primates on the left. So this is a list here of all different kinds of primates, starting with the most primitive, which are in turn uh, derived from the, uh, the common ancestor with rodents. And so some, a lot of the very primitive uh, primates have a squirrel-like character to them, some of the lemurs and tarsiers, and, um, which you can find in Madagascar. Then. Um, these are the South American monkeys right here. These include the one I just showed you a photo of with the pendulous clitoris. And these are other African uh, monkeys and great apes. And here are humans, and here's the bonobo, uh, our uh, closest common ancestor, uh, closest species with whom we share a common ancestor. And this is the habitat uh, in uh, that I visited in in August 2021 I visited the Appenhol Zoo in the town of Appledorn in Holland to photograph these bonobos now the top slide shows the bonobo habitat at the zoo and the bonobos spend the night in the structure over here at the top left and each morning the zookeeper in the center distributes food he has a basket here of food and then the bonobos exit their structure to forage for food as shown in the lower right. Now the top left shows the clitoris of, an, of a sub-adult bonobo. Its placement facilitates a form of same-sex mating called GG rubbing, where the females rub their clitorises with each other leading to orgasm accompanied with squeals of joy. To alleviate conflict over the food that's scattered throughout the habitat, because the, the, the uh, bonobos are foraging in the habitat, they encounter the food, they're often encountering the same food, and there's conflict over who gets to have the piece of food that they see. And to alleviate this con conflict, the females carry out lots of same-sex mating in various positions. The top right is face-to-face -face lying down. The bottom left is face-to-face -face sitting up. The bottom is back-to-back. -back. And notice that one of the females is carrying her baby throughout the encounters. There's a baby there. And in case you haven't seen enough sex yet, here are two more positions. The top left is front-to-back. And then this one is genital touching. So female bonobos could write their own Kama Sutra. Now, lest one think bonobo behavior is relevant, irrelevant to the human experience, the photo on the top right is the primate family tree extended now to humans. The bottom left is the famous 1974 specimen of Australopithecus afarensis, known as Lucy that was discovered in Ethiopia by Donald Johansson. Notice the head size, that the head size and the height agree with the bonobo, but Lucy is a bit more bipedal. The lower right shows a hominin family tree illustrating how the genus Australopithecus, which is down here, um, gives rise to the modern genus Homo. Now, scientists have speculated that the placement of the human clitoris might reflect its prior use among bonobo females, an interpretation I term the mark of Sappho. I turn now from animals to gender expression in humans. Let us begin here close to home. 
Many Indian nations and tribes in the Americas have two-spirit people, a name that suggests people who possess a combination of feminine and masculine nature. Collectively, these people include male-bodied individuals living as women and female-bodied individuals living as men. On the left is a 1900 photograph of Oshtish, a male-bodied, two-spirit person from the Crow Nation in the present-day Wyoming Dakotas, who lived as a woman. On the right is a 1990s photograph of a female, a female-bodied, two-spirit person from northwestern South America who lived as a male, and specifically as a warrior. This warrior, dressed in male clothing, presents a confident, almost jaunty manner, with no attempt to cover or bind the breasts. The middle is a painting of another female-bodied warrior from the Plains Indians between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. Notice the bare breasts here. Two-spirit people assume cross-gender occupations. They do not try to hide or modify their anatomy because in these cultures, occupation rather than, gen rather than genital morphology are the markers of gender identity. The people referred to in the Bible as eunuchs formed a counterpart to the transgender people of today. The top, the left, the top left shows an icon of a gender variant Christian that I photographed at an old church during a visit to Ethiopia in 2009. In the center is another icon of a gender variant Christian that I photographed on a cave wall in Cappadocia, Turkey in 2008. And the right shows a reproduction of the Cappadocian cave wall painting that serves as a decoration in a shop selling souvenir items to tourists near the entrance to the complex of caves. Local people in Cappadocia are well aware of the icon depicting a gender variant Christian although no one seems to know the parable or other story to which the icon refers. Now, many eunuchs were slaves bought and sold in a slave market. Their roles extend from serving as domestic servants to serving in the royal administrations of Greek kingdoms of the Eastern Mediterranean. A conspicuous occupation for free eunuchs was to serve as priestesses to a goddess called the mother of the gods, Saibio. The top left shows a reconstruction of the Yorkshire town where a Sibelian altar was found. The bottom left shows the feminine bracelets worn by the male-bodied person found there. And the right shows the artist's depiction of the apparel worn by the priestess. The Sibelian priestesses had religious rites for performing a kind of sex reassignment surgery. These took place each year in the spring on March 24th. After the operation, a Sibelian priestess adopts women's clothing, including wearing a veil and jewelry and growing long hair. One would expect hostility from the early, Christian, from the early Christians to the Sibelian priestesses because Sibeli worship was a rival religion to Christianity. Yet the Bible takes a, a different approach. At the bottom of the slide, Jesus is quoted as saying, for there are eunuchs who have been eunuchs from birth, there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by other people, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs because of the kingdom of heaven. Those who can accept it should accept it. Furthermore, in Acts 8, the evangelist Philip puts Jesus' teaching into practice. And I quote this in detail. Bapti Philip baptizes a eunuch in the Christian church. Philip has gone to the city of Samaria to preach. Then an angel from the Lord spoke to Philip. At noon, take the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he did. Meanwhile, an Ethiopian man was on his way home from Jerusalem, where he had come to worship. He was a eunuch and an official responsible for the entire treasury of Candace. 
He was reading the prophet Isaiah while he was sitting in his carriage. The spirit told Philip, approach this carriage and stay with it. The eunuch invited Philip to come up and sit with him. As they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what would keep me from being baptized? Philip said to him, if you believe with all your heart, you can be. The eunuch answered, I believe in that Jesus Christ is God's son. He ordered that the carriage halt. Both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water where Philip baptized him. Now reflect on this event. How would Philip know that the person in the, char in the chariot was a eunuch? The person had to be conspicuously different from ordinary men, recognizably male, but also feminine to some degree, or otherwise Philip would not know the person to be a eunuch. Reflect too on the condition that Philip stipulated for membership in the church. One must believe in Jesus as, as God's son, and that's it. No limit on participation. Collectively, the passages in the Bible concerning eunuchs comprise an affirmation of diversity in gender expression. These passages are not ambiguous one-liners inviting misappropriation. Nor in the Bible's writings are eunuchs ever attended by any hint of moral approbation. In 2006, I was invited to give a plenary talk to a conference in New Delhi sponsored by UNAID. I agreed to come if I could meet and interview members from a group of over one million transgender people known as Hijra. The Hijra com comprise both a caste and religious sect. The word Hijra was translated by colonial British as eunuch, reflecting the Hijra use of an indigenous sex reassignment surgery called the Nirvan. Hijra religion focuses on devotion to the mother, the mother goddess Mata. The religion is principally Hindu with some elements of Islam. After the conference, I was taken to shanty towns, including the one shown on the slide, which is under a highway bridge. A typical occupation of Hijra is to perform celebrations at the birth of a male child and at weddings to offer the blessings of Mata. The Hijra sing and dance as a small band with drums, tambourines, and flutes. With the westernization of India, the demand for these ceremonies is declining and Hijra increasingly work in the sex trade or in begging. This slide shows a group of Hijra sex workers that I met. Hijra are, recognized, are organized nationally into seven named houses. Elders from each house meet collectively to formally approve the admission of a candidate to the Hijra. A candidate hedra is called a chila and is apprenticed to a guru. The slide shows a guru in the white sari with a chila on her left side. I am sitting toward her right side. The chila gives the guru her earnings and submits to her authority. The guru is responsible for the welfare of her chila. A guru usually lives with her chilas in a small commune typically five or so. Occasionally, a hijra marries and lives with her husband. The guru's husband is sitting next to me on my right. Now, transgender people occur throughout Oceania. On the left is a transgender woman from Guam who is attending this conference I was at in India. Now, on the right are transgender people from Hawaii called Mahu that I met on a different occasion, also in 2006. Mahu occur throughout Polynesia and are prominent in Tahiti. The event I attended with Mahu took place in Hilo, a town on the Big Island of Hawaii. The event included a show with Hawaiian and Western music. 
Shows with transgender people on the U.S. mainland typically comprise beauty contests, cotillions, or drag talent for a primarily gay male audience. In contrast, the show in Hawaii was a mostly clean fun girls' night out for straight, straight women, many of whom were married with families. I conclude with a technical issue. Um, the Western perspective on transgender people relies on a medical construction that presumes a heterosexual gender binary as standard and views variation from that binary as genetic or psychological pathology. Then space is made for variant people by appealing to the moral principle of human rights. Quote, even the disabled have rights, unquote. This medical construction of gay and transgender, of gay and transgender as a genetic defect is a mistake that reflects an ignorance of elementary population genetics. For a genetic trait to be considered as a pathology, it must be deleterious under all circumstances. In population genetics, a connection is known between how rare a pathological trait is and how deleterious it is. The more deleterious a trait is, the rarer it is. For example, almost lethal traits like Huntington's disease are pre present in five per 100,000 births, hemophilia A at one birth per 8,500, and so forth, very rare. Now, gay and transgender people are nowhere close to being this rare. According to the most recent 2016 demographic information from the Williams Institute at UCLA, in the U.S., 3.5% of, of adults, 3.5% of adults identifies lesbian, gay, or bisexual, and an estimated 0.6% of adults identify as transgender. This degree of rarity, or the degree of rarity, for genetic pathology is set by a balance between two rates, the rates at which a pathology arises by mutation and the rate at which it is eliminated by natural selection. The balance point between input and output, the balance point is called a mutation selection equilibrium. The slide presents a table showing the balance point between rarity and deleteriousness assuming a mutation rate of healthy to pathology of one in a million. Rarity is measured in terms of birth. Deleteriousness is measured in terms of percentage loss of survival and or fecundity caused by the pathology. And this, is, this measure is called the Darwinian fitness in population genetic jargon. So if the pathology is lethal, like at the bottom line of the table, then the trait is exceedingly rare, i.e. one in a million representing a fresh mutation at each instance. For pathologies that are only slightly deleterious, the pathology becomes much and much more common, as indicated in the lines toward the top of the table. So compare the rarity of gay and transgender people with what the table says their deleteriousness would be if gay and transgender were a genetic pathology. For gay, for gays, the rarity lies between the top two lines of the table over here. For trans, the, their rarity lies between the second and third lines of the table. For both, the deleterious is so no, so low as to be effectively non-existent. Instead, the gay straight and cis-trans dichotomies probably represent so-called genetic polymorphisms in the human species population. The gay, straight, and cis-trans polymorphism frequencies have been more or less stable through many generations, and these polymorphisms probably represent what population geneticists call protected polymorphisms. That is, a gay strategy can increase when rare into a population mostly of straights, and a straight strategy can increase when rare 
in a population mostly of gays, leading to a polymorphism at some intermediate frequency. Similarly, a trans strategy can increase when rare, and a cis strategy can too, leading to a cis-trans stable polymorphism. So, the, the overarching theme to the preceding slides from zoology and anthropology is that the sex-gender binary is a quaint myth of historical interest. Perhaps not so quaint, though, because belief in the binary leads to medical mistakes, harmful social policy, and religious abuse. In biology, nature abhors a category. The sex and gender binaries are categories. Natural variation among organisms inexorably spills over and under the definitional walls of any category, dissolving the walls themselves. Our challenge is to understand the adaptive pressures that cause organisms to flow beyond their definitional constraints. Our challenge is to resist the temptation to shore up those constraints by condemning the escaped variation as genetic error, pathology, or sin. Instead, variation in gender and sexuality is an adaptive expression of life itself, and it is good. Thank you. Thank you, Joan, for a fascinating talk that has taken us across the globe and across time through disciplines of zoology, anthropology, and religious studies. Um, my name is Brian Riedel. I am an associate director at the Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality, and I'm delighted to be facilitating this evening's conversation. I invite you all to add your questions to the Q&A, and we have already received a great many of them. Uh, we will do our best to get to as many of them as possible. And, and I thought we might start off with a, a big question that this talk really centers itself in, and that's the relationship between religion and science. Joan, would you talk a little bit about how you see the relationship between religion and science, not just in the talk that you've given, but, but perhaps in your larger work? Oh, uh, well, on my reading of, uh, of Genesis in, uh, off the top of my head, I think in, in chapter two, um, is that God uh, created uh, the natural processes on earth. There, there are phrases about he's made the winds blow. And, uh, and so I view the mechanism, if you will, of God's uh, bringing his creation into being as uh, taking place through the natural processes that scientists study. And uh, and I think in a sense you learn you learn about creation, but you learn in a sense about God uh, by studying uh, the processes in nature. Um, and uh, and and therefore, uh, and that's not a novel position to me. Uh, many scientists who are Christian take essentially the same view. Um, but, uh, the, the, I, I guess that's sufficient. I, I think I should leave it at that. Very good. Very good. And in many ways that, that gives a, a kind of segue into some other questions about how the science tells us about gender and about how religion tells us about gender. Uh, one of the notes that you make is about uh, a zoological definition of gender that is based on gamete size, where the, the small gametes are defined as male bodies and the, the larger gametes uh, are, are larger bodies uh, for, for female. And in Evolution's Rainbow, uh, you note that some species 
do have gametes that don't fit into the, the big, small model. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about how that male-female binary uh, attached to gamete size uh, works with those exceptions that you know? And, and how do you think about the exceptions and the norm? Well, the exceptions are, I mean, exceedingly rare and mm -hmm. highly specialized. So I really don't count them uh, as even relating to the binary because um, the sum drosophila, if I recall correctly, uh, in which um, the uh, some, some sperm uh, help other sperm in a way so that they're, they're um, uh, nurse nursing other sperm and you you see this even in a in seeds sometimes if i recall correctly that uh, a, a seed will have uh, uh, nursing cells uh, next to the uh, little seedling that's growing and um, it, each case like this is very specialized and uh, these uh, extra cells uh, may or may not uh, even be fertile. Um, and uh, I think that I vaguely recall that there was one case where there were two sizes of sperm where uh, the one sperm brought more uh, material with it than the other sperm. So one sperm was quicker, but the other offered more food and so that when the zygote was fer fertilized by the big sperm, it had more food to go with than the, than the one with the little sperm. But the little sperm were able to fertilize more because they were so quick or some story like that. <laughs> so these are really, really rare. And, and uh, so much so that I, I don't even bring them up in a talk like this because uh, they're misleadingly rare. So you would think that this was somehow an exception to the generalization mm -hmm. that every species has two gamete sizes because that that's still the case. And uh, um, every you know sexually reproduced species. Now there are some uh, some species that are like volvox. I mean you can find some species that don't have male or female distinguishing each other so that all the gametes are the same size. And there you sometimes have different mating types. So some, some of these gametes are um, um, uh, incompatible with others. And volvox is a particularly interesting species in this regard. And some of the species that are barely multicellular uh, will have, uh, um, so, there, so you get sort of an aggregation of a, a multicellular organism of just four or five cells making the organism. And then sometimes those have uh, uh, several gamete sizes. Um, so you'd have to look, as I say, the, the vol volvox, the kind of algae, is, is probably mm. the best example of that. But um, uh, no, the, the gamete size distinction is, is the, ge the generalization to go to the bank with. There you go. There you go. Though nature abhors a category, this one is pretty consistent, it seems. Yeah, this one's pretty consistent, but I mean, you could also look at, at these, at Volvox as a, a case of escaping yet another category. <laughs> mm. Well, I'd like to transition over to a question from the audience, uh, from an undergraduate uh, who writes uh, that they are writing a thesis on male caregivers, perhaps some uh, a personage that escapes some categories by, by some people or stay-at-home dads. And they were struck by the claim that males must bring something more than their genes to reproduction. Yeah. And uh, they ask what your take is on male nurturing in non-human species. Is it more common than we might think, they wonder? Oh, it's really common. Uh, if you look at just at vertebrates, for example, um, if there's if there's parental care at all in fish, it's almost always by the male. And uh, and then if you look at mammals, it's almost always by the female because uh, the females have internal fertilization and, and gestation inside. So in placental females, in placental mammals, 
you know, there's uh, uh, birth that's given to the birth canal and all that. And in marsupials, the again, it's the female who has the pouch that the, the little embryo develops in. Now in birds, it's sort of more of a 50-50 deal because of both species, particularly with seabirds, uh, both species, both sexes are uh, jointly feeding uh, the young. Also in many songbirds, that's also true. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, th there's, a, there's a lot of cases th throughout even the vertebrates of male parental care. And uh, it should be in no sense uh, assumed that that's only the case, that that's anomalous. And, and males care. Uh, it's often said by people in this field that uh, males can be promiscuous because uh, they can go around and fertilize a lot of females and the females wind up being stuck with the, uh, with the young. And, uh, but then you look at the actual behavior of even human males with respect to their young and the, uh, the, the efforts that, that, that um, males go th men go through to, uh, to retain uh, visitation rights and uh, uh, some control and some time with the offspring they're not supposed to care about if they're all that promiscuous. And, um, and I think that there's a lot of uh, lore about male promiscuity that, that just isn't true. And it, male parental care um, uh, is, you know, it, it definitely happens and, there's, and males care about, about their young. And they should too, because from the standpoint of natural selection, the um, success under natural selection involves delivering offspring into the next generation. It doesn't involve mating. Mating is uh, instrumental to, to having offspring, but it's not, uh, as we've seen in the bonobos, there's a lot of mating going on that has no direct reproductive um, uh, connection. And so uh, the focus, particularly in an area of evolutionary biological sexual selection theory, the focus is on mating all the time, which is uh, unfortunate because uh, even according to Darwin's theory of evolution, uh, it involves getting offspring into the next generation. And then that generation leaves on more offspring to, to the one after that. And, and so the focus should be on offspring delivery into the next generation. And if a male is promiscuous and then doesn't have anything to say about the offspring, then he's basically uh, leaving his reproductive uh, potential uh, out uh, at, at, at risk, and that's why the male has an, has an evolutionary incentive to retain some control and to have some parental provision to ensure that uh, his and his reproductive contribution gets goes forward. Uh, Thus, something more to offer than just the genetics. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, the gene, even the gametes are are themselves just obviously tiny. You have to deliver a whole body into the next generation. And uh, uh, so f a focus on, uh, on mating itself and, uh, and, and just on, on gametes. Gametes is useful f to distinguish between males and females uh, as, a, as the criterion we were just discussing, but um, it's, it's not, not the whole thing. <laughs> That, that offers a segue into another question that we, we have from the audience about what might be the, the limits and benefits of the analogies that we draw between animals and humans. So, so much of the, the talk that you've offered is the, the variety of things in the animal world and the variety of things in the human world, perhaps as if they're, they're similar or, or not. I, I'm not entirely sure how the analogy ought to work. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about how that analogy is and isn't working? Well, the, uh, the position of people who are uh, gay or, or transgendered, uh, what they're dealing with all the time is the accusation that they're unnatural and that they're sinful. And um, 
Now, the science has to show that they're not unnatural. So there's a lot of variation in gender and sexuality in nature that's under perfectly normal conditions. There's nothing forced about them, about it. And so it's there. And so it's so when people like those in Congress and elsewhere say that this is unnatural, they're just dead wrong. And the one thing that this science is important for is coming up with the evidence that this variation in gender and sexuality is totally natural. Now, um, on the other hand, that doesn't necessarily mean it's good because a disease is natural too. So it could be argued that, okay, well, this is natural, but it's still wrong. But then we come to the fact that uh, so that species in which there is uh, same, same sex sexual behavior and so on are very successful species. And there's a bona fide function and use for all the same sex sexuality involved in differs in the social situation of one species to the next, but it's generally um, the mutual exchange of pleasure, which then leads to coordination and cooperation because you cooperate with somebody that, that um, uh, you've had a good time with, that you've uh, had an enjoyable experience with, and it leads to bonding. And bonding and coordination are key to, to cooperation, and cooperation is key to getting more resources, watching out for predators, and doing tasks that require more than an individual's effort by him or herself. And so, the, so not only is the same-sex sexuality and uh, uh, natural, it's good. Then the other thing that, that gay and transgender people are, are being attacked for, okay, it's natural and it's good, but it's still sinful. And for that, you actually have to look at the text of, of religious texts and ask, uh, uh, do religious texts in fact condemn it as sinful? And they don't. And I don't know what Bible some of these folks are reading, but um, it's just not there. And they, there's a tiny passage in one of uh, Paul's writings uh, which is really directed towards uh, orgies, which include as a component same-sex sexuality, but it's the orgy itself which he's condemning, and he's very uh, into uh, condemning things like orgies. Uh, and valuing the body more than the spirit is the a sense of uh, Paul's writings on it. But the writings from about eunuchs, both in the Old Testament, I didn't quote that, there's Isaiah's writings as well, and then there's Jesus' writing uh, statement. And then there's this long parable in Acts. Now, we make it absolutely clear that uh, there's nothing sinful about being a eunuch. And, uh, and so therefore, uh, so then the only question that remains is, well, are eunuchs a different category of people than the ones we now call transgender? You know, are we talking about a different, different thing altogether? And there, there's a, a great book by Matthew Kepler um, called Masculinity in the Late Roman Empire. And uh, he goes into the uh, uh, Latin on this and, and really goes into an extensive description of who the, um, the eunuchs were. And I, uh, some of what I gave here quote, quotes from his work. And you find that um, this whole business of uh, uh, dressing in uh, a gender... Um, appropriate way corresponding with your gender identity. Uh, the early Romans, like the, the Western uh, societies, tend to regard gender identity as connected with genital shape. So these are all the societies which have some kind of sex reassignment surgeries. Then you find the other societies in which genders, gender identity is realized through occupation. Then you don't find any of the sex reassignment surgeries going on. And um, so these uh, it's, it's, uh, it's perfectly obvious that, uh, that there's nothing sinful about the variation. And the construction of sinfulness is, uh, is really an attempt to suppress. And, uh, uh, and it's, um, it, it's like other forms of discrimination, uh, racial discrimination and so forth. It's a way 
for the d discriminator to take advantage of the mm -hmm. discriminatee, if you would. Yeah, I really appreciate how, in the way that you've just framed that, the entire talk that you've given is thus an answer to each of these arguments and a counter argument. It's not natural. No, it is natural. It's not good. It's not good for us. Actually, it is good for us. It's, it's sinful. No, it's not sinful. Yeah. But there's another argument that seems to be relatively new, and, and I wonder what your take on it might be. It's not fair. This is an argument that is being raised around transgender athletes. And I wonder if your work could help us think through that contemporary question. How, how do you think your, your work and research might help us think that through? Well, um, the... the uh phenomenon of the transgender athletes uh, is pretty new. Uh, and uh, the, uh, in fact, even the coming out of transgender people is relatively new. Um, and, uh, and so, and the first people to come out transgender were adults and often having gone through decades of life uh, be living in the closet. Um, so this, the idea of uh, people transitioning very young is quite new. Of course, there always were some children who at the age of three or four knew they were misclassified, but more typically, um, uh, certainly with the adults, there's a long track record of having been in the closet and you can establish that they really were serious and had been serious for decades. Whereas for, it's, it's a hard call sometimes for people who are in their teens. And so uh, it, um, and, and it's, a, it's a, a transitioning is not to be taken lightly. Um, and and uh, so some of the procedures that have been described are, are, again, relatively recent procedures, and they're just to postpone uh, puberty de development during puberty to allow for more time for decisions and more, uh, more thought into the matter. Um, and now for, for the transgender athletes in particular, the, uh, there has to be, has to be um, some respect, if you will, on both sides. The, the transgender athletes uh, do need to uh, respect the possible uh, unfair advantage that they may have. They themselves have to initiate some kind of uh, awareness and uh, attempt to ameliorate any injustice they may be causing. I mean, they can't just assume that, that they can d declare uh, a right to um, participate in a way in which um, uh, cis uh, women, in, in the case of the swimmer, um, uh, can't possibly match. Leah there's Thomas no is the person. Uh, yeah, there's no entitlement in that. So they, they have that responsibility. But on the other hand, the organizers of these events and so on have also have a responsibility to recognize that, that this kind of variation really does occur in the human population. And uh, I remember there was a, a runner, uh, uh, if I recall, an African runner. Pastor uh, Semenya, perhaps you're thinking of? Yeah, who uh, has a very uh, masculine physique, but there's no doubt that, that uh, she was a woman. She had to go through all kinds of tests and so forth. And uh, I mean, that's, that's the way it is. And, uh, and so, if, if you don't want to accept the, the, the natural variation among people, even within a sex, which is very wide, um, then uh, you'd need some other kind of classification. You'd need to have, and I'm saying hypothetically here, we need to have, instead of male and female, we need to have a bunch of categories where we measure everybody's testosterone. We measure everybody's uh, estrogen count. And we say, okay, well, you're in testosterone category 10, you're in testosterone category nine and work on down and then have only competitions within these uh, uh, hormonally identified category types instead of just male and female. 
And, um, but that, no one wants to go that route. Uh, but that's what uh, uh, the reductio ad absurdum is uh, if, if we start insisting that everyone be the same. The whole point of uh, an athletic event is to show which people happen to be endowed and trained uh, to win it. Mm. And, uh, and there's no doubt that someone who uh, is uh, endowed uh, with muscles and so on, that uh, uh, even without transgender people, uh, well, considering the issue of transgender, uh, all the athletes aren't the same. And so it, it emerges through competition who's the faster runner. And who's the faster runner is that way because of some genes they, she, he or she inherited, and which endows them with the capability to run. And so uh, if, if some people are um, uh, ha have a big masculine build, then that'll give them some advantages. Now, uh, in some sports, but not in other sports. Yeah, it, it, and so you'd have to choose choose the sport. So I think that that there's a lot of uh, give and take and mutual understanding that can be done by both sides. There's no entitlement uh, that a transgender person isn't automatically entitled uh, to an unfair advantage if one exists. And uh, the uh, sports authority isn't entitled to claim that there automatically is an unfair advantage. And we all know that after a year or two of, of the hormones and so on, if there were any initial advantage, it pretty, dissolves pretty fast. So uh, through, um, through after the transition. So uh, it'd be nice if both sides talked a little more. Mm. Mm. I understand that there's lots of talks right now uh, among the International Olympic Committee and uh, also here at Rice uh, as well. So uh, I, I'd like to shift gears a little bit uh, to another question from uh, our audience. And uh, this one offers uh, a, a question about maybe definitions. So this is returning to the example of transgender animals. And it, uh, the audience member asks, what are male traits or female traits for transgender animals. If a trait is shared by both, would that not make the trait belong, uh, not belong to a binary? Is the trait then seen as an average of a phenotype uh, of what is observed in sexed organisms? No, uh, no, in the case of these hummingbirds, I mean, there aren't a lot of papers published that are specifically about transgender animals, whereas there are increasingly uh, number of papers published about uh, uh, same-sex matings in animals. So that's getting into the hundreds now. But, um, and of course, examples are far more numerous than that. But the, uh, uh, the hummingbird case is that the trait, the trait is that gorget, that uh, the, the feathers underneath the bib right there. And uh, now if they were uh, present 50-50 in both males and females, you couldn't say that it, that it was a male trait or a female trait. But given that it's present at 90% in males, or 95%, and then there are 5 or 10% of the females with it, it's that, that difference in number that allows you to say, okay, well, if that's a male trait, the, the gorget, and if 10% of the females have it, then we can say, well, that then is a male trait in a female. And, uh, and it depends on the, the, it's, uh, the transgender idea would only be well-defined if the majority of the one sex had one trait and the majority of the great, the large majority of one sex had one trait and the large majority of the other sex had, the, had some other trait. And then there was just a small percentage of uh, individuals in either sex that had the majority one from the other sex. See what I'm saying? And that's, I, that's I, what makes it. Yeah, I think the counter example that you gave in, in a, a written version was about ear size, right? And that ear size is not necessarily uh, distributed across uh, 
sexed bodies in, in a way that you know large ears go to the male body and small ears go to the female body. It, am I remembering that correctly? <laughs> you may, but I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, I, I think we have time for about one more question. So I, I'd like to, to, to offer you a question about reception. So you're bringing together so many different fields. You're bringing together zoology and anthropology and religious studies in a, in a powerful argument about the, the natural variation in sex and gender. How is this argument received in those different spaces? How are you received by evolutionary biologists who I, I believe uh, Victoria in her introduction was talking about how there's some uh, defensiveness uh, among biologists, perhaps, and, you know, how are you received among anthropologists and how are you received among biblical scholars just for one set of religious studies scholars. Um, well, it's hard to generalize. Uh, for the, the simpler one is the latter, uh, that uh, I, I wrote an article together with uh, uh, Patty Jung, uh, who, is, who was at that time chair of the theology department at uh, North, uh, at Loyola, at uh, Loyola in Chicago. And we wrote a paper together on the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, and, uh, and so, that was a contribution to, to, to the theological literature. Obviously, I can't do that because I'd, I'd be freelancing if I uh, were just, you know, sounding off about uh, um, theological teaching and from the Bible. I mean, I can read the Bible, but it, it doesn't really count uh, academically unless it's uh, with someone who, who's trained as a theologian. Now, I don't know how that paper has been received. Uh, I'm not aware of any objection to it. I'm not sure how well it's known. I've given it to some clergy who, who've asked and they like it. <laughs> uh, clergy generally tend to like uh, an article written uh, for them rather than for scientists. <laughs> so they're not that keen on, on, uh, on the biology stuff. Now, among the evolutionary biologists, um, well, as you know, the defense of sexual selection theory uh, runs deep. And sexual selection theory, for, the, for those of you who aren't following all this stuff, it's the part of Darwin that you may have heard of in connection with the peacock. Why does the peacock have its big tail? And the peacock is supposed to have its big tail because it's advertising its great genes. And the female is supposed to walk around and choose the male with the biggest tail because that way she gets the best genes for her, her offspring. And it's this story of a uh, uh, male uh, of good genes and of a hierarchy, really, of genetic quality in the males that the females are supposed to discern. And that, uh, now it, it also turns out that, <laughs> that a lot of things, biologists count on a lot of things as sexual selection. Another definition of sexual selection it has to do with this uh, ma males being more promiscuous than females. And Darwin has some quotations that seem to support that too, that uh, males are more promiscuous because their sperm are cheap. And so they can go around fertilizing all these females. The females have expensive eggs, and so they have to be very choosy. And that's another sexual selection narrative. And so there's a collection of these narratives that are all under the rubric of sexual selection. And I've said that, by and large, all of these are false. And, uh, and that's greeted, uh, um, greeted with a, quite a bit of hostility. But there we are, uh, and I've offered a, a lot of evidence as to why they don't make sense and why they're often self-contradictory. And um, people who are into sexual selection theory just have to deal with it. I mean, they've they've got a lot on their plate. Uh, and if we look at the at the kind of diversity that I've shown you in, in these slides, in the in the end, sexual selection theory or sexual selection thinking is just not a tool 
that with which you can address all the variety out there. You have to keep adding all these little extra little stories and caveats and and amendments and so on to deal with the diversity and you're uh, handicapping yourself to try to understand natural diversity if you take a sexual selection position as your starting point. It's, uh, and so it's only a matter of time till, till uh, that happens, to, 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 to sexual selection theory just collapses because uh, I may not be alive when that happens, but it is only a matter of time. Great. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us tonight. I, for one, have learned quite a lot and uh, was entertained at the same time. So thank you. Thank you for this talk. And thank you all for being with us and joining us tonight. We hope that you will also join us next week for a webinar featuring uh, Sarah Galtieri and her work on Arab women in the United States. Stay tuned to your emails for that. And with that, we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Okay.